Okay, once we get into the rest of this chapter, we're only going to focus on rate laws that have one single reactant, one single variable. Uh, the reason is, is we're doing some calculus here, although we're not going to do it. You can see it in the word integrated. Um, we're going to convert our rate laws into integrated rate laws, and we can go back and forth between them. So if I know a reaction is zero order, Ka to the zero power, I can integrate that using some calculus and derive this integrated rate law. Um, now we don't want to do calculus with more than one variable, so we're just going to stick with these guys. And um, if you don't know the calculus, or if you just don't want to do it, you can simply memorize these and you don't have to understand where it comes from mathematically. Uh, but know that we're going to look at zero first and second order reactions for this section. And again, once I define, if I know, like in the previous unit, if, or um, the previous sections, if I know that I get a first order rate law, I'm allowed to come over here and use this rate law as well. I can use both of them. So when do I use each one? Well, the rate law, uh, which we just call the rate law, is actually called the differential rate law. Um, and this is how does the rate, and this is an initial rate, change versus concentration. And that is an initial concentration. So it looks at the initial conditions only, rate and concentration. And there's no time element in there. Uh, and this looks at multiple trials. When I go to the integrated rate law, now I'm, I'm not looking at the rate anymore. I'm looking at one single trial. How does the concentration at any time change over time? How does the concentration change versus time? And this rate law is, you know, here's my initial concentration, initial, initial. And then these are kind of like the finals, and they should have like a little subscript here, the concentration at a given time. And then the time piece is in there as well. Um, K is still a part of those. So if I know K over in this first order rate law, it's the same K over here. I can use it at different times. So we just, we're trying to find an equation set to use, and then I can use both of them to answer questions. Now these are in Y equals MX plus B format um, because experimentally the only way to figure out which one we have is to graph them. So for a zero order rate law we are graphing concentration versus time. For a first order rate law it's natural log of the concentration versus time. And for a second order it's inverse concentration over time. One of those, we're going to graph all three, one of them will give us a straight line. Whichever one gives us a straight line is the correct relationship. And then you'll notice there our slope is actually the, the rate constant. The rate constants will always be positive, um, but in our equation they might be negative, so our negative line is in there just because we have a negative slopes. Um, in order to get the rate constant, um, we need to just make them positive. So for zero and first order, it's negative kT, but for second order, it's positive kT because that's going to be a positive slope if it's second order. Now, there are ha um, half-life reactions that go with each of these as well. You're welcome to memorize them, but at a half-life, a half-life is a time. So if you know this equation zero, for zero order, um, you can answer half-life questions without the, the memorizing a half-life equation. Because it's like, what is the half-life? Well, it's the time when the final concentration is half of the initial. And we can do that for first order. What time is the final concentration equal to half of the initial? So implicit in these there, we're going to talk about half-lifes, but we can use these if the concentration is half the original, that time is a half-life time. Uh, but here they are, in case you are curious and wanted to read them or memorize them. Um, important to note here is that it's where the concentration is. For a zero order, um, the higher my concentration, the, the longer the time. For my second order, it's in the denominator, so the higher my concentration, the lower the time. Um, but then for my first rate order, it actually doesn't depend on half-life. How you've defined half-life for all of nuclear chemistry is actually first order kinetics. Um, because it does not matter how much you have, the time will be constant. The half-life for zero and second order can actually change. Each successive half-life is different than the one before. But the one that you're familiar with is nuclear chemistry. All nuclear chemistry is first order kinetics. 
the half-life, if it's 5,000 years, every half-life will be 5,000 years because it is not dependent on concentration. So that's just kind of a, a technical point going forward. You might see, um, you might see that. So let's answer some questions. Here's a data set. Uh, now the only way to do this is to graph it. We take this and we say, okay, determine the order of the reaction and the value of the rate constant. Since this is time data, we need to graph it and we need to find the slope. So we just need to plug this into our calculator. Um, we are trying to get, um, in one graph is going to be the concentration versus time. And the other one is natural log of the concentration versus time. And then the last one is 1 over the concentration versus time. Okay? Um, and this one is... Oh, it doesn't actually say what the, what the chemical is. Uh, so we look at those. For This is for zero order. This is first order. And this is second order. When we're doing this, we're looking for an R-squared value. An R squared value tells me how good it fits a Y equals MX plus B straight line. Um, and then we're also going to keep track of the slope for each one of these as well, because that is going to be my rate constant, K. So we just need to put these in our calculator. And once we put all those in, um, and it's just best to write them all down as we go, my zero order R squared value is 0 0.9715. And since I was on that screen anyway, I wrote the slope down as 0.0, it's negative, 0 .00191. Zero, um, now remember, K is always positive, because my zero order reaction has a negative K. K will always be positive, so we kind of want the absolute value of these guys. Uh, first order is 0 0.9997, so that one looks to be the case, and my slope is negative... 0 0.00358. Now K is positive that. Uh, second order, just to double check, because sometimes they can both be really, really close, we do want the better, better one, 0.977. Uh, that one is not it, but the slope here is positive, because this one is positive, 728. Okay, so after all that, we know it's not zero, it's not first order or it's not zero order, it's not second order, it is a first order, and my slope is going to be, um, in this case, negative k, we want the absolute value, k is going to be 0 0.00358. And if this is a first order reaction, the units of k are going to be um, inverse seconds. Okay. Um, let's move on. So now we just have some practice problems. It says a first order rate constant decay for this reaction is there. So there's our K value. If we begin with a 5.26 gram sample, how much will be left after 1.96 days? Okay, so this is a time question, and we know that it's first order kinetics because it's nuclear chemistry and decay. Uh, so my rate law is... Ka to the first, or in this case, Krn to the first. Or my time data is going to be the natural log of radon at a given time is equal to negative Kt plus the natural log of the initial concentration of radon. And that can be in masses, no big deal. Um, so how much will be left after 1.96 days? So natural log... Uh, the radon equals negative 0 0.181 days, inverse days. Um, the time is going to be 1.96 days plus the natural log, and I'm going to run out of room here. Let's move this over. Um, of my 5.28 grams. Okay. Um, that simplifies to the natural log of the radon is going to be 1.309. Uh, 
Now, if you don't know how to solve for the natural log, um, there's a button on your calculator attached to the natural log that says e to the x. If we take that e to the x and we raise both sides to that, that value, these are going to cancel out, and it's going to give me my radon equals e to the 1.309, which is going to equal 3.2. 7.03 grams, so 3.70 grams of the radon is going to be left. Okay, that's my first question. Now the second question says, what's my half-life? Well, the half-life is the time when we have half of our sample left. So if we go back to our reaction, um, if we started with um, 5.28 grams, then half of that is going to be 2.64 grams. So the natural long of 2.64 is going to equal negative K, which is 0.181. Now we don't know the time. This is the half-life time plus the natural log of my 5.28 gram sample to start with. Okay. Um, now this one you don't need the natural logs because you can just put them in your calculator and hit enter and then you solve for the time and when we say half-life that is a time so the time it takes for half of it to decay is going to be 3.83 days. And we know this one's in days because my, um, my rate constant K is in inverse days, so this one's going to be in days. Okay. Uh, percentages and fractions are also used in radioactive decay questions because it doesn't matter how much you start with. So um, we know that they're first order reactions, uh, but if they don't give you amounts, you can, you can make them up. You can use percentages, you can use fractions. Um, so when a reaction is 90% complete, what is the initial and final concentration? Uh, well, we, we don't really know an initial that they gave us, but we can assume we start with 100%, okay? And then if it's 90% complete, my final is going to be 10%. Um, and if we wanted to do it in fractions, we could say I started with 1, and then I ended with 0.1, or 1 tenth, Okay. Um, so you can plug those in as your initial and final concentrations in the absence of a value. Typically, they do that with first-order kinetics, but if it's zero or second, they would give you a value. So if you are given a value in the problem, use it. But if they just give you numbers, feel free to use uh, make up your percentages or fractions and your starting amounts as well to get nice, clean numbers. This one says when 75% remains, what is the initial and final? Well, if 75% remains, that means I'm still starting with 100 is my initial, and now 75% remaining means I'm ending at 75%. Notice this other one said 90% 90, 90 complete means I only have 10% left. This said 75% remains, I only lost 25%. So initial and final. And what are the final concentration after one half-life or two half-lives? Well, assuming we start with 100%, after one half-life we know we're going to have 50%. After another half-life, we're going to have 25%. So that's two half-lives. We could keep going forever. 12.5%. That's a three half-lives. Um, but don't let, the, don't let the lack of information... You can start with um, percentages and fractions as your initial and final amounts. Just look at the words and, and take good note of what variables you're given. Okay, so here we have a second order rate law. So second order for the iodine, it says rate equals Ki squared. That's second order. That also tells us that we can use our second order integrated rate law, 1 over the concentration of iodine at final, at time t, equals positive kt plus 1 over my initial iodine. So we have both of those equations we can use. First, what are the proper units of K? Well, it's second order, so we're going to say uh, subtract 1 and invert it. Liters per mole seconds. Those are K. If iodine is 
calculate the final iodine concentration at 2.5 times 10 to the negative seventh seconds. So here we're going to need our time data for B. So one over my final iodine equals KT, I lost K there, um, K is 7.0 times 10 to the ninth power. Okay. The time is 2.5 times 10 to the negative seventh seconds. Um, plus 1 over my initial is 0.4. And we get our iodine concentration at the end equal to 5.71 uh, times 10 to the negative fourth power. Okay. Uh, C says calculate the half-life. And they give us the initial is 0.4, and that's important. So the half-life is when that equals 0.2. 1 over 0.2 equals um, kT, so 7.0 times 10 to the ninth. We don't know the half-life time. Plus 1 over the initial is 0.4. And we can solve for our time. So our time is going to be equal to 3.57 times 10 to the negative tenth. So really quick half-life seconds. So we have a half-life. Um, so now it says if the iodine is 0.8 molar, how much time would it take for 75% to react? Now, we only want to make up numbers if they don't give them to us. So don't look at this as two half-lifes because that only works. Uh, you can only go half and half for first-order kinetics, and this one is second-order. So if we look at this and we say, okay, 75% remains. Well, my initial is 0.8. Um, that means 0.6 is going to be gone. We're left with 0.2. So my final is 0.2 equals kT, 7.0, times 10 to the 9th. We don't know the time, but my initial in this one is 0.8. So we can solve for the time again. And we get uh, 5.36 times 10 to the negative 10th seconds. Okay, um, so we take a look at this problem and we say, okay, second order kinetics, we, most of the, the problem that we need to do is identify what rate laws to use. So I have my integrated rate law, and I have my differential rate law, and I have my values of k. Once we know the three, the rate law, the two rate laws in k, then we just use them to solve problems over and over and over and over again. So the, the construct for all of these is going to be the same. Um, find your rate law, zero first or second order, and then you get two equations out of it, okay? And you have to, you have to use which one, it, depending on the circumstances. You need to find K with units, Okay, and then you need to apply it to new situations. Now that you have the rate laws, you can predict any, you can predict that reaction at any time or concentration. So you just use them uh, with some algebra to solve some new problems.